Hey, YouTube, welcome back to the video version of the Realignment Podcast. I'm speaking with Steve Krakauer. He is the author of Uncovered, How the Media Got Cozy with Power, Abandoned Its Principles, and Lost the People. We're hitting a lot of important topics that really matter, especially because we're about halfway between now and the 2024 presidential election. So much of the 2020 campaign and the 2016 campaign came down to the media. So looking at what went wrong, what is working, what needs to change is the center of everything. Hope you all enjoy the conversation. Steve Krakauer, welcome to The Realignment. Hey, great to be here. Yeah, great to speak with you. I've been following your work for a while, and we haven't done a media criticism episode in a while, so this is a good chance to get into that. But speaking of media, for this conversation especially, could you define what the media actually is? Uh, it's, a, it's a tough question, right? It's 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 complicated. Uh, as I actually I lay out in the in the first chapter of the book, I I have different definitions of it. The media, and I know it's in the subtitle of the book, but it was sort of shorthand. Uh, I think it is there. Are, there are several parts of the media. Um, I describe a lot of the Acela media, which I call sort of a term I I didn't make up, but I I use a lot, um, which is p- media that's based in New York and DC. Um, Sort of similar to like the corporate media um, that is, you know, largely based in that Acela corridor. Uh, and I do think that that's differentiated from, say, legacy media, which are more of the older outlets, a lot of times like the CBS, ABC, NBC of the world. And uh, and then I think the mainstream media, just kind of another term for for more on the corporate side. And then I would also contrast that with the independent media, which is a part of the media also, um, but is you know the YouTubes and the podcasts and the Substacks of the world, uh, which is on the rise both financially and in terms of power in, in the media space. They're part of the media too. Uh, it's just a, a very different one. And I think for the most part, when I talk about the media in the book, uh, it's it's aimed at that Acela corporate media that that is a you know sort of a structure of the main TV networks. The main national newspapers and and digital and websites that are associated with those. You know, it's interesting. You come from a let's say legacy media slash mainstream media background. Yeah. Um, I worked at PBS before I got into independent media. So we both share the mutual background story of like we came up in this very specific old world that in many ways we get narrative points for competing against or we talking trash about, but we also are rooted in those experiences. So here is my first question. What has been the biggest thing you've noticed since you got into the independent media space in terms of contrasting with your legacy media um, background? Because I, I just personally rankle a bit when folks who you know, fellow YouTubers, sub stackers, et cetera, kind of critique it because it turns of it verges into conspiracy theorizing very, very, very quickly. When, as you know, if you spend any time in a control room or in any of these spaces, you're like, if this were a conspiracy theory, it'd actually kind of be easier to handle rather right. than like a series of cascading disasters and bad incentives and failing business models stacking up on top of each other. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And that's exactly right. And it's it's why it's not so easy to say that everything's a big conspiracy and it makes the the book really just kind of a maybe a 500 word uh, essay. Um, but instead it's a it's a full it's a full book because I think there are lots of different factors at play that that make the media, the corporate media what it is today. Um, and I do think some of it's financial. Some of it is like the incentive structure that you talk about when it comes to things like social media and the the way that, uh, that has made certain decisions or kept people from making certain decisions that's absolutely at play in the corporate press today. Um, I think that there is a gen- general fear in some in some cases of of backlash. And in fact, I, I would say if you if you ask me, what's the main difference between independent media? And the corporate media, and again, I was at CNN in 2013, not that long ago. Um, but I think just from conversations that I've had, it's gotten worse. And and it's always a good sign for to me of like the contrasting realities when I hear from people who you know know me from my newsletter or from what I do with Megan Kelly's show or now this book who reach out to me privately, you know, direct message, email, text message, and essentially are agreeing with certain points, but are things they would never say publicly for fear of. Of what may happen to them. There's some sort of backlash. And uh, and that's that's a big difference, I think. But to, to your other point, I think that sometimes in the corporate media, when there's mistakes happen or when there's really poor coverage, 
Hunter Biden laptop is a good example of this. There is this ju- there is this conspiracy, I think, when it, when it comes to stories like that. But oftentimes that's not the case. Oftentimes it's just a general incompetence or laziness or or just you know not wanting to ruffle feathers, and and that that actually leads to so many more mistakes than than actually the the more broader conspiracies that people think is is really everything in the media. You know, I think this is the perfect time. And you're obviously doing this on purpose to release this book in the sense that we're right in between presidential campaigns. There's been enough distance from 2019 and 2016, even 2015, for us to actually look at what happened and then sort of chart a path going forward. Let's start with the Hunter Biden story. Can you just, especially because the show hasn't focused on this topic as much, can you just tell us two different kind of sets of analysis? So A, like, what do we straight up know happened? With the Hunter Biden laptop story, and then two, how did the mainstream corporate media handle the story? And that's also going to involve tech platforms. And yeah. where do you diverge in terms of like what the media should have done versus what it actually did? So Hunter Biden story, what did the yeah. media do, and what should the media have done in a different sense? Yeah, it, it's it's a hugely consequential story because I really think it was it, it had the the elements of some of the the bad problems with the media during the Trump years, but it really was brought into a new set of problems, a new set of issues that I think we've seen that almost started with that, and then we've seen since then when stories like COVID and others in the last couple of years since Trump's left office. So, I, I think you know the, the, it's important to note that this was October of 2020. Then the New York Post. Puts right on the cover uh, this the the first information, first reporting that came from the Hunter Biden laptop, which you have to understand also was at least we can say shadily sourced. You know, Rudy Giuliani is involved, and actually it's not Rudy Giuliani directly; it's his, Rudy Giuliani's lawyer who's involved. And there's a half blind computer repair shop guy who apparently had a Hunter Biden just dropped off his laptop and then forgot about it for years. And he gave this to the FBI, and then the FBI did nothing with it. I mean, it was, even in the moment, a very strange story. Uh, And obviously, we also have the context of the fact that it was three weeks until a very consequential election. So that did happen. And and that was something that I think would give the average journalist um, of, let's say, the New York Times or of CNN some pause in covering the story as it was. By the way, quick thing, too. I know plenty of center right journalists who would hear the story that you just articulated and also say, hey, whoa, that's kind of weird. Um, critical, critical thing to understand there, too. Absolutely. In fact, uh, it was not covered extensively at first by Fox News, and it's and it was actually passed on by the Wall Street Journal. So other places within the News Corp environment uh in that moment. So so yes, that is important context to it. But what happened there almost instantly as it was published was something unprecedented when it came to tech, tech censorship. So Twitter made it so that, first of all, the New York Post was locked out of their account and completely, and they remained locked out of their account for weeks, including- When they after. shared the story to be- Yes. Precise. As soon as they shared that story, New York Post's account was was shut down. They were, they were forced to delete that tweet to that story, or they would remain locked out of their account. But not just them. Anyone who shared a link to that story that was was going to be suspended by Twitter was suspended by Twitter, and the link itself was made so you could not go to the the website from Twitter. You couldn't do it publicly. You couldn't do it through direct message. It was an action that Twitter had never taken before and has never taken since on a single link. So that's also important. Now, what it, when I started writing the book, I went back. I tried to to go back into the what actually happened here, and it's amazing to look at it. Maggie Haberman, for example, from the New York Times shared a link to the New York Post, a place that she used to work, to this story, and and just sort of questioned the sourcing on it. But the fact that she did that, shared that link, got her trending on Twitter as MAGA Haberman for daring to even link to it. Uh, Jake Sherman, now of Punchbowl News, shared the link, got locked out of his Twitter account was forced to delete the tweet. And then instead of sort of thinking to himself, well, this is strange. I don't know if this is this is really right. He went and apologized in a three tweet thread about why he was so sorry that he dared to send a link, even though he was only saying, I wonder if the Biden campaign will respond to this. So we saw a tremendous tech overreach. We saw now 
fast forward a little bit, we see with the Twitter files that there was a real partnership. I mean, I would say there were conversations happening with the FBI before the uh, before the story came out that made it so that the when the Twitter censors believed that it was Russian disinformation when it was published. So we we now know that there was an actual collusion there, and that I would put the media with that because soon after the story was published. A whole group of people like the James Clappers of the world and the John Brennans and many other former intel agency officials with lots of credentials said it had all the hallmarks of a Russian disinformation campaign. And sure, that's their prerogative to say that. But then the media then ran with that story as the narrative. Now, they will say we never called it disinformation, but they certainly never said that it could be this or it could be that. They said only that it seemed to be disinformation based on all these very reputable sources, some of whom we currently pay as contributors. So that was the context of this story. And then fast forward way into the distance, we now know, thanks to reporting by people like the New York Times and the CNN, that this laptop story was absolutely true, was was totally legitimate, that as surprising as it may seem, the story checks out, at least as far as what we can tell. So, So we saw Yes, I think some of the mistakes, it was Trump associated. And so there was this this instant feeling of this is toxic and contaminated and we can't touch it. But we also saw a real subservience by the press to allow for censorship under the guise of stopping misinformation or disinformation. And I think that has actually gotten worse. Okay, so I want to unpack this story across a few different levels because the way you told it especially hits on, I think, a lot of the themes we were hitting in the book. So number one, um, when you're talking about the press and acquiescing to censorship, are you suggesting that, and I'm not saying this in an accusatory fashion that it sounded that yeah. way, are you suggesting that what the press should have done is instead of Jake Sherman, you know, deleting and apologizing, you should have had, because once again, like the New York Post has New York Post to write covers, headlines every once in a while, but this is still like within the bounds of what like an official news, this, this isn't, you know, Breitbart news at its worst in terms right. of like legitimacy. And it, let me put it this way, as a New York Times reporter on a couple of different levels, you are not going to tweet a tweet storm in defense of Breitbart. But in this case, though, you think there was enough um, let's say perverse action that fellow journalists should have said, Hey, this censorship isn't the right idea. You shouldn't have to delete this tweet, this, 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 and that. That's what you mean by acquiescing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that there's a difference. Be, I, I can understand the argument that maybe they don't even, maybe even in the moment, they don't start to treat the story as if it's legitimate and 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 shine a light on it. You know, maybe they don't even acknowledge it. But they have colleagues. I mean, there are New York Post reporters in that White House briefing room every day. They, this is a very legitimate outlet. I would actually say Breitbart's as legitimate as an outlet, you know, as others. But this is sort of as generous Post, as possible to the New York Times reporters and the uh, yes, you know ether yes, as possible. Sure, but at the very least, yes, the New York Post is is a legitimate news organization. They have sensational covers and, and headlines and things. But the and so you can hold two things to be true. You can potentially slow roll your coverage of this. You know, like we saw during the the Mueller investigation, you know, the New York Times publishes a one source who has a knowledge of what's happening with Mueller and his thinking and that becomes a 24-hour news cycle on cable news. Okay, I understand you're not going to do that with the story, but at the very least, you can support your colleagues in not being overtly censored in a completely ridiculous way. Um, that didn't happen. So yeah, I think you can kind of thread that needle. They don't have to necessarily treat it as if it's true, but you I can also say that this is overly censorious and we don't support that. We, 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 we should, they should be allowed to publish this story, even if we're not going to shine a light on it ourselves. And I, I just want to point out one other thing. I think that there was also a hangover effect from 2016 because the media, I don't believe truthfully, but they believe that they were, they felt a level of guilt in how they covered Hillary's emails and whether they were help, well, they were potentially responsible for putting Donald Trump in office in 2016 by the way that they gave that so much attention. They were criticized by the left because of that. So, so they didn't want to make that same mistake again. So I, I think that that was also a matter of, of not feeling that guilt and not wanting to be in that same boat by covering this story this way. Yeah, no, I'm glad you um, brought up the email question because I was going to take that there next. Um, the funny thing is I've got a decently diverse uh, Twitter follow ecosystem. And whenever I see anything remotely critical of Biden, Kamala Harris, et cetera, 
um, from let's say like a center left cover from a center left perspective at the New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, you'll very quickly get rather prominent credentialed people saying, but her emails dot dot dot. Right. Right. Which is which is a very direct attack because what you were because you said this, but what what is explicitly being stated here is you center left journalists, institution, et cetera, are doing the exact same thing. You are taking this minuscule thing that ultimately doesn't matter that much in the scale of things, um, and basically offering Donald Trump, offering this thing that we oppose, real fodder for changing the future direction of of the country. And you know, frankly, given just the the Supreme Court decisions around China. Like this was a momentous four-year period. This isn't like, you know, the mid-90s when we're debating whether or not we're going to wear school uniforms or not. So within that perspective, what advice would you have for, once again, like the center left kind of just, I don't want to say normie in the sense of just like average, but in the sense of like, you're just a center left like editor at a prominent magazine, um, uh, journalism institution. What do you say when you're, when, when, when you're base? Is launching that attack on you? Yeah, it's it's well a couple of things because I think you know in in the book I talked to um, two dozen people on the record. Uh, everyone who I talked to was on the record, and several of them who are all in the pre- you know in the mainstream press in many cases. Um, people like Tara Palmieri now of Puck News, previously was at um, Politico and ABC. Uh, Olivia Newsy now of New York Magazine. A lot of them point to this real effect that you have to have a level of self awareness to be able to. I mean, it sounds a little bit extreme, but like withstand the pressures that come from places like Twitter, which has a real effect on people. And I, another person I talked to in the book is Sharon Waxman, who uh, started the, the website The Wrap. And she was very honest. She said that, you know, she has seen her own reporters uh, move away from a story or cover it a certain way or not cover it at all because of the chilling effect that Twitter has because of the reaction they may get. And you saw it during the Trump years, Olivia and Tara talk about how we cover a story in a certain way and you get all this applause on Twitter and you cover it, you know, cover it in a less, you know, negative way about Trump or a less positive way about Biden and you get all this negative feedback. But the advice to the editor is Twitter is not real life. As much as I love Twitter and I spend a lot of time there, it is completely not representative of the average American and even the average consumer of your own content. It is the loudest most extreme in many cases, voices. And I've also kind of curated a feed that I like, and it's a mix of voices, but most people don't operate that way. And you have to understand that 50 people yelling at you, editor, is not the end of the world. It's, it should not adjust what your journalistic principles are. And I think in many cases, they fell victim to that. They, they were There was a real fear of what might happen from the loudest voices on Twitter, because as we see, that becomes the snowball effect, and then it gets covered by other outlets, and then it and then there's a real pressure campaign. It can lead to people getting fired or people, you know, uh, uh, you know, having being reprimanded and 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 taking action in terms of how they adjust their coverage. So that fear has to be over, you know, overcome by by an editor that is has some standing and can can stand their ground. Another uh, good question. Let's get to the collusion when it comes to the FBI and tech platforms. So obviously anything Russia related has gotten so deep into a culture war hole that we're not going to be able to extricate ourselves from it. But, you know, let's restate the collusion issue. Um, I'm in the firm belief that we're in a cold war um, with China right now. Um, it's widely agreed, I think, because it's so different than the Russia issue of it. There have been um, Chinese attempts to influence or interfere in American elections. I think it's completely reasonable for the FBI to be in touch with operationally American tech platforms about those efforts. Um, let me know if there's anything I said that you disagree with. Um, but if if we are going to have an international environment where you do have foreign interference, I'm not saying it swings the result, but there, it, this just is something that's happening. We could call that collusion. Or we could say that's what national security looks like. So what, what do you think is a proper relationship between, let's just say, policing forces, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, state electors, even secretaries of state, you know, this could happen on a state level too, and a tech platform? It's a fascinating question because I, I agree with you. I, I think that I was not shocked by the fact that there was, the, you know, the Twitter files revealed that there were conversations ongoing all the time by the FBI and Twitter, by, you know, both campaigns, by the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign and Twitter. That's what those places do. That's what in, in many ways, as you say, that's perhaps what they should do. What is what they shouldn't do. And and I, I, I think 
I, I again, I almost don't even fault Twitter so much for falling victim to this. I know, you know, people like, uh, uh, you know the the chief censor there, who I know was kicked out. I forgot I forgot his name now. Um, he, you know, you know, the, he, it's not incumbent on him to be the guy who's this arbiter of you know free speech and all that. Like I, I feel some level of of sympathy. I think for these people who are in these positions. The problem though is when you bring that third element to this, which is the media. Um, and the media, I, I would say, when working properly should be the check on that, right? So I, I give an example in the book. I talked to Josh Rogan uh, of the Washington Post. Um, Josh wrote a great book about China and about, uh, he was really, the timing was great because he ended up being about COVID in a lot of ways also. And he was one of the first reporters to report on the Wuhan cables that were re revealing, um, you know, these horrible lab conditions at the Wuhan Institute of Virology that potentially showed that it might've been a lab leak that, that started COVID. He wrote about this in his book, and then he excerpted that in Politico, and Politico uh, published this. It was you know, an excerpt from his, his well-reported book, and that link was taken down by Facebook. It was unshareable. It was banned from Facebook. And Josh, you know, he's a mainstream reporter. He got in touch with Facebook and was like, hey, guys, like, what's, what's going on? And they put it back on, and then they banned it again, and they put it back on. And it got Josh thinking that listen, I'm I have the the outlet to to talk to Facebook and to talk to these these censors and and convince them of that of why they need to put it back on there, whether they're getting spun by the FBI or others or you know the Fauci's of the world or why they should take it down. But the average person doesn't have that. And so when you have people like Josh is is a very you know very rare case in the mainstream media who cares about this and cares about getting this information out there. We need the press to speak on behalf of the people who are getting censored. Well, these conversations between the intel agencies and uh, and these tech platforms are taking place. So then, I think that's the perfect story there. So, are you, so this is actually good because you're speaking about you know Wuhan lab leak. Um, it's now not just widely reported, but there are whole parts of the U.S. federal government, including you know at the FBI of Christopher Way, um, the FBI, um, FBI director, who are in favor of some form of like lab leak um, theory. There, what's just right. the lesson there? Like, what's the story? Yeah, I I think that the 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 story for the, from a media perspective um, on the lab leak theory, on vaccines, on masks, on lockdowns. You know, I talked to Dr. Jay Bhattacharya in the book, who was one of the authors of Stanford, you know, doctor who was an, one of the, the three who made the Great Barrington Declaration, um, which was just an argument for more targeted approach to lockdowns and protecting the elderly, um, and was treated like a kook by the media. But because they were, he, the media didn't know who he was, the media did it because they were in the service of Dr. Fauci and um, of the medical establishment, medical elite, the people that they trusted. And so I think in all of these stories, in all of these COVID stories that I lay out in the book and, and with the lab leak theory in particular, it's, it's that the press should be curious, that they shouldn't jump to conclusions, that they need to be introspective when they get things wrong. And when you have a very complicated story, which COVID was, I, I don't fault the media for making mistakes when it comes to their coverage of COVID, especially in the early days. I get it. But this is when, when it gets complicated, that's when you need to be most open-minded to a variety of perspectives and most suspicious of people that are telling you it's only one way. You know, I I, I give a tweet, uh, I, I show a tweet in the book of Nate Silver of ABC and 538, who in reference to the lab leak theory was saying that when you have a story where there's evidence on both sides and there's experts on both sides making their arguments, but only one side is concerned about policing the discourse, that's when you know that side is mostly is, is most likely to be wrong. And that's what would happen here. And the media joined that side, joined the side for policing the discourse on all these stories, rather than opening it up and having a, a wide array of, of conversations and discussions, I think, because they didn't have trust in the public to understand that it was a nuanced conversation. I think the question that uh, comes from that, and this is a big theme of the episode, really, which is that it seems like the press uh, and and we'll get to you know independent media and more like conservative media in a second. But it seems like the mainstream center left press really struggled over the past six years with air with issue areas that were polarized in either direction. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying yeah. it was the press necessarily polarized it, but so for example, and I think this was you know Trump at his worst when Trump is saying you know kung flu. Um, right. That instantly, within the um, perspective of a New York Times reader, turned the lab leak 
how responsible is the CCP for this like outbreak story from a science-based investigative one to just a directionally partisan one? Uh, if yep. you are in favor of this theory, you're supporting Trump, this, 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 or that. Um, obviously, there's very little the press can do. Um, well, there's literally nothing the press can do to control, control Trump. I think Kung Flu was a really terrible um, phrasing. On, just not just from a like, this is offensive, but like, that's not what you should have. That polarized the debate. You should try to not polarize these debates as much as possible. But once an issue has been polarized, what should the media actually do? Because like it seems the way you're telling the story is you basically say, oh man, privately, of course, sucks that Trump said that. That said, Trump doesn't determine whether or not X, Y, and Z happened. Therefore, right. that, that's seems how I would handle it. Like, how, how do you think folks should handle it? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. And that is is precisely the way that they don't handle it. You know, I, uh, Ben Smith, uh, the editor of Semaphore, is uh, has a, a great analogy in the book where, you know, and he, he's been in these newsrooms in Politico, he was in BuzzFeed for a long time, New York Times uh, most recently. And, you know, he says the, the, the mainstream press, or I would call the corporate press, has a tendency where, yes, anything that is like getting a lot of attention on Fox News, you know, he, he, he gives an example of like the, uh, the, the migrant caravan that was on the, on the way, you know, Anytime that there's a, there's this this culture war issue or something that's being give, given a lot of attention on the right, there's an instinct, like a knee jerk instinct, and it only got so much worse when it came to Trump. I mean, you know, it, it happened, but with Republicans before, but but Trump just you know completely amplified that. There's an instinct by the press to treat that issue as too contaminated to even touch, to even bring into, when really you know it could do a service by. To digging into that story, maybe there's some truth there. Maybe there's some. Maybe there's not some truth. Let's let's kind of get into this to the weeds of it. You know, it's an immigration story. Okay, well, here's the truth. But 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 they just they just completely treat it like it's not worthy of of even even any sort of conversation. And 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 again, I mean that that instinct is antithetical to journalism. I would say, but it also like if you really believe that Donald Trump is an existential threat to democracy, as I do think some people in those news, newsrooms did during the Trump years, then that's when you need to really adhere to your principles more than any other time. That's when you need to convince the most people. And the only way you're going to convince the most people of what you're saying is by sticking to your principles and by you know double and triple checking your fact. Instead, they went the other direction. The guardrails were off. Now, all of a sudden, no, you, you, we needed two sources. Now, we only need one. Now, we only need eh, kind of a half a source. It's too important to do it. That that's not that's not how it's supposed to work, and that's not. You need to to adhere to your principles even more if you're trying to make that case in a real way. I want to pivot to independent media, um, and this isn't a critique of your book, but it's more just a. I think something that troubles me when I think about how these ecosystems actually work. So a lot of your work is around the theme of trust and how yeah. clearly um, corporate press, mainstream media, etc., has lost a lot of trust. I wonder. And this is all borne out in polling. So I know for sure this isn't just something like you're just like making it up for your own partisan objectives, but I kind of wonder about the bad incentives for independent media. So for example, um, you know, I, I do work for Breaking Points. I'm going on Crystal Ball's yeah. podcast tomorrow, but like Crystal would often end um, pitches for Supercast subscribers by saying, say, screw you to the mainstream media. <laughs> so what I kind of like worry about is we have a situation where as independent creators, we have an incentive to what's the book this way? Like the press could take every single one of the recommendations you offer in the book to the letter, and you are still going to have a rising independent media who has every incentive to say, "Oh, it doesn't matter. Screw that." Like my incentive, and I don't do this because I'm, you know, paid by grants. So I don't actually care about this, but <laughs> they're definitely. I'd get more views if I said, "Hey, like I do long form interviews, like Ezra Klein. Ezra Klein over is a left wing hack at the New York Slimes, and blah 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 <laughs> blah." No matter what yeah. Ezra does. So how do you basically separate the fact that there is a real trust deficit with the fact that there are forces that I think are incentivized to always say the media is like full of shit? That's a that's a really interesting introspective question, uh, and and I I agree with you. I think a couple of things. First of all, I I think that the American people the American people would be best served by a strong independent media and a strong corporate institutional press. I I think that we need both. In in a perfect world, we need both. We we need. Uh, like I, I would love if we opened the New York Times and turned on CNN and felt everyone in the country, left, right, and center, felt like we were getting the news. It was just the boring old news. Like that's, the, I think we need that in this country. I think we have that in some countries, and it does a real service. At the same time, you have people on the outside who can cover other stories or or more local stories or more niche stories. Like I, I think that that is a perfect world. 
I don't think that's happening anytime soon, but I do think that, that that's an ideal scenario. The other thing that you say is like, you know, a lot of the independent media, I'm thinking about like, I'm, I'm, I have a newsletter on Substack, you know, there's, there's the subscription model um, is really, it's hard not to try to serve your audience in to exactly what they want in the same way that I would say places like a CNN really try to carve away the areas where maybe their audience wouldn't want and only focus on what they knew their audience really wanted in that it in there is some overlap there and i think it's it's incumbent on on people in the media on on whether on the independent side or outside of it to occasionally uh you know n- not give the, the the their audience exactly what they want because their audience will actually i think a, a lot of instances will um will respect them more and will appreciate that. You know, I, I talk about this with, um, Megan Kelly and you know, my, my day job, I'm, I'm a producer of the Megan Kelly show. Um, we talk about this with Megan a lot, you know, it's, it's, we have great respect for our audience, but that sometimes means saying things that the audience doesn't want to hear. Uh, and I mean, every, every, who knows that the audience is, is big, they want to lift different things, but a broad swath of the audience, there's going to be backlash to, um, you know, we, we saw this right after the 2020 election. Um, and after giving the, attention to and and the respect to say what is there something here are all these lawsuits legitimate and then determining no it's not and so so we lost and so so you know i I think that it's incumbent on everyone no matter where you are in the spectrum of independent or or large institutions um to respect the audience to trust the audience but to also not be at a hundred percent service of only giving them you know the the you know the candy rather than the vegetables sometimes you know something i wonder and i I really appreciate uh hearing that um you and megan and your crew over there are bringing that same mentality um i want to i want to toot our own horns for a second um apologies audience and basically say that i think that's reflecting the fact that we came up in legacy media i mean i mean is that i I think i think something that legacy media does very well but i often do not see from independent creators especially in their 20s who did not who just kind of like discovered real quick that they're really good at youtube or these the the, the legacy media at its best and this usually tends to come from like a great boss who's like you know a couple decades older than you is like look values this institution matters there are just like things you do and that you do not do um, yeah. that's just like an underlying rowdy and the institutions at their best. I think PBS is great at this, like really like helped me learn that. I think this probably is true in, in your career and in, in Megan's career. How do you think an independent news ecosystem where you have a, where like, think about this, if you're an independent sub stacker, like not only are you the writer or are you the like producer of like the actual like product on YouTube, but you're like often running the business, you have all these things going, like, how do you think value transition works in a space where a lot of folks aren't going to say to themselves, man, I just want to make 30 K working in New York city at CNN. <laughs> when actually, if you're good at this, you don't have to do that. How, how, tell me about that. Cause that's more of like a future facing concern that I have. That's more of like a 2028 problem, but how do you think about that? Yeah, it's it, it it's a tough one. It, it really is because I I see this also. I I was just talking to someone else about this where it's like, I, I think that a lot of people in these newsrooms, younger journalists, um, see what happens on Substack and see the the top end, see the people you know really making six figures and and beyond on Substack or or on YouTube, um, growing these giant audiences, Instagram. Am, and think to themselves, why am I, you know, making you know fifty, sixty thousand dollars right now at this at this job, and I'm and kind of moving along slowly. I could do this, you know. I and and in a lot of cases, I would just say you you really can't. It's not that it's not that easy. It's not like having, you know, 10, 15, 20, 000 followers on Twitter is going to translate to growing a, a dedicated audience on Substack necessarily. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily work that way either. And I I kind of think like you do, where we are at this moment right now that feels like there is it's a bit of the wild west right now on the independent side. I yeah. think that there's going to be a lot of shaking out of of winners and losers, both in independent media and in corporate media, where the landscape's going to look very different two years from now. I think in both sides. And I do think that it's incumbent on even the independent side of the of the of the the media to think about things from a from a bigger picture perspective. You know, th- think about like you can the best journalism takes resources, it takes legal departments in some cases to to back you if you're really going after something big. Um, you know, there's a reason why Glenn Greenwald could do the Snowden investigations and the Snowden reporting 
at the Guardian and win Pulitzer Prizes because of it. And could he have done that on Substack? Maybe. But I, I tend to think that it would have been a lot harder. And so I think there's there's lots of benefits to it. But I do think what independent creators are going to realize is that working together, banding together, having some structure, even if it's outside of the current gatekeepers and you don't have to necessarily go back into, into that world, or potentially having official or unofficial partnerships with more institutional outlets that can be mutually beneficial. They can get the kind of clout of working with someone cool on the outside and you can get the benefit of working. I think that those kind of things are are going to be beneficial in the long run for both sides of the equation. Yeah, I think you kind of took it back to an earlier answer you gave where at the end of the day, when it comes to you know selling books or doing a podcast conversation, it's easy to just treat these as either ors. But the obvious truth is you're going to have things like mixed in. You're going to have you know one of one of my favorite um, you know and Jamil Hill is obviously controversial, especially with a, a right audience. But someone wrote this like really great piece. Um, Jared Dicker, he's a, a VC in the crypto space, where he yeah. pointed out like, hey, like Jamil Hill, she's got an Atlantic column, she's got a studio, but she does with Spotify. She's got a book contract. She's actually stacked up a bunch of things. So she does in partnership, others she does like independently. And that's what the future of top, top, top tier talent looks like. So here's a, here's another question. Um, you know, you, you work with Megan Everdan. I don't want you to speak for her, but she obviously is a incredibly talented person who came up like in Fox News and that like media. How would you advise someone who has Megan's like skill set to like pursue their media career today? Um, would you say like, look, it's all about the Fox News hit? Um, it's all about like getting into that studio, this, this, or that, or is it like Instagram, like, all these different platforms? Like, how do you think about that as a producer? Oh, that's a fascinating one. Um, let me just say first of all that Jared Dicker, I, I I like his work. I think it's probably a different piece, but I actually quote him in the book um, in describing uh, the 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 journalism outlets of tomorrow as sort of like the record labels, yes. where you know people kind of go in and you you're you're associated with them, and you kind of it's mutually beneficial. Is a fascinating uh, think about the media. Look, I think that first of all, I would say I've I've even before I started working with Megan, I wrote a piece. I describe her as as a unicorn, um, a big basketball fan, and like you know, Giannis is a unicorn, Luke is a unicorn. These are people that there is they're singular, they're unique, um, and and there's no one like him. I think that there are, are certain people in the media like that. There's Joe Rogan, there's Tucker Carlson, there's Megan Kelly. There's like there there are things that can't be replicated because of the of the skill set that they bring to exactly what they're doing. So, with that said. The journalist of tomorrow, the person who wants to be um, someone who is doing like what she's doing now, I I think that Megan works best, you know, in in this more independent format podcast, YouTube, working with Sirius XM, um, because she has some some very real, I mean, a lengthy uh, track record in her case of working in some of, of of different newsrooms, you know, and at Fox, at NBC, um, that's very helpful. Don't need it, but I think that's helpful. Um, I also think that uh, one of the things that distinguishes Megan from from the average person, and I, th I think it comes across, and she mentions this, is that she is an avid consumer of media and not just the media you would think, but I mean, much more than even I am. I mean, she is, and I feel like I'm constantly listening to podcasts and watching things and reading things. She's constantly going from all sides. I mean, uh, every, you know, listen to the daily, uh, the New York times and NPR, and then, you know, the national review and, and, uh, and, and getting a full spectrum of, of, of taking things in, um, because that will help you in, in whatever you do. If that's, if this is what you want to pursue, that will be helpful to at least understand what the landscape looks like and what other people are, are talking about. Um, and then the last thing I would say is like, is, is doing it because, um, the barrier to entry now is so is so low. Like you can start a podcast very easily. It might not be very listened to, and that's fine. Um, but you can do that. You can have a conversation, or you can talk, and then you can cut, chop that up, and you can turn that into YouTube clips or or Instagram or Twitter. And and it's um, it's a way of just getting a feel for it. And uh, and that never used to be the case. I mean, you could, you know, we, we, there were blogs at one point, sure, but the the way of of actually kind of like having building a career or at least attempting to um, on your own is really possible now. And so, I would say to do that, I would to consume a lot and try a lot, and uh, and then see what sticks, see what see what you feel is 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 your niche. 
So next question, um, and this is my weird obsession that always comes up at, at Breaking Point shows. I am like a unironic uh, lover of CNN, like not in the sense that like I watch <laughs> CNN, but like I, I, one of my like heroes is Ted Turner. Um, okay. I, th I think that like OG, like 1980s, yep. like Ted Turner is like one of the coolest um, business leaders alive. And it's actually kind of like too bad that because of the AOL Time Warner deal going bad in the 2000s, like he's just like not really remember people in our like age cohort. Um, I was a unironic subscriber to CNN Plus just because I wanted, I, I want like the underlying brand to like figure itself out. Obviously, um, I yeah. got my refund within a month because <laughs> it I, I, I got, it, did, it, did, it did not work. Um, what is your advice for CNN? Because like we could say all we want about like, oh, like this specific personality sucks or Don Lemon's cringe. The underlying problems of business is a business level problem that no one quite has figured out a solution to. Yeah. Um, what's just your advice at like a broader level for the platform? Because yeah. it does and something. Was, it, do, it does something that's so important, right? Like getting someone in Kabul um, as yeah. at, like independent media cannot and frankly should not do it. Like I love your point. Like independent media does some things really well. I think it does op eds and opinion very well. Um, better than I think constrained op ed boards do. I think right. though, like getting someone with a freaking camera and a million dollar insurance policy is the definition of what CNN should be doing. So I yep. worry about it struggling. I do too. I do too. I'm I'm with you. I, I was a I was a huge CNN you know nerd before I I got the job there. And I, and I loved working there. But I, I was there for three years. Um, I really love my time there. I worked with a variety of people, including Jeff Zucker, my last year there. Um, and and I think we do need a strong CNN. And and I think that it went off the rails a bit uh, during the Trump years. They have obviously got new management there now with Chris Licht. Um, I think the mission that Chris has has brought in uh, to reestablish news and uh, curiosity in some cases, uh, I think that's the right one. And so I'm bullish on the future of it. But what can they do? I think unfortunately. It's going to take a, a much larger full-scale restructuring of of the talent and of the of the setup of of the the process than has taken place so far. Um, you can't just start moving Don Lemon from the night to the morning and expect a, a different vibe from Don Lemon. Unfortunately, and I, I like Don also. I, I worked with him. Um, I think he just he bought into the hype too much during the Trump years, and it's just it's hard to put that genie back in the bottle now. So I think you need new people. Um, I think you need people who don't want to become stars and don't want to make a name for themselves. And I think it's going to be extremely challenging because Trump is running again. Look Wait, at the quick, polls quick, right quick, now. Quick, quick pause. Uh, I want to push on that. Yeah, we could think that people wanting to be stars is like a bad thing. But we're also talking about views, right? So like, yeah, don't stars bring in because that's like that. That's that's where the slippery slope starts. Don't you want a bunch of stars? Like, look at Tucker. Tucker brings in crazy numbers of Fox. Why shouldn't CNN want to have like a stable of Tuckers? Like, putting ideology aside. Yeah, it's it, it it's the it's the um it's the effect, not the cause. You know, it's it's like the chicken or egg thing. You you shouldn't you shouldn't go in with the goal of of bringing in stars so that you get ratings. You should bring in great people that are serving the mission of what you're trying to do. And 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 if you are if you are adhering to that mission, I think you'll get ratings. But I also don't even think it's the ratings is not what's most important. I think that this is the key to what to how CNN can come back. And I will say, just from the way Chris has talked, I, I and, and David Zaslav on top of them, I, I think they understand this. You CNN's business, like the core television business, is not necessarily the nightly ebbs and flows of ratings. It is winning the big moments, elections breaking news. Yes. Making sure that you are established there. And the way you do that is by making sure you are now just synonymous with the news again. That changed during the Trump years. But if you can get back to that, that benefits you because then you, you bring in the viewers when there's actual news, but also because in conversations with about carriage fees with cable providers and with you know, satellite services, you can charge a premium if you are seen as trustworthy by a large swath of the American public. So then it doesn't matter what the ratings are. If you're seen that way, if you're perceived that way, then you can charge a premium for your content. Brand value. That changed, yeah, the value of, of, your, of your organization, the value of your content. So if they can get that back, if they can reestablish, they can actually move the needle on independents. Maybe you're not, maybe you lost the right, but independents who, who have regained a level of trust for you, that will be beneficial to the bottom line also, because then you could actually charge more for what your content is with the cable providers.
I think to the the last question, we spent a decent amount of time pissing off the you know left end of the audience, where it's you know piss off the right end of the audience. Okay, where does Fox News and conservative media come into this? I think this. I, I think my biggest critique of independent media's coverage of just like the struggles of legacy media is that Fox is often just like left out of that analysis because at the end of the day, like the way I would describe a lot of like the breaking points audience, especially people who are there for soccer, is like. It's not that they're Republicans. It's not that they're conservatives. They just definitely like are very like against like the status quo and they're against kind of like the left. So Fox yeah. News is kind of this like awkward thing, which is just best not acknowledged. Like what, if anything, is your critique of Fox News and their issues with election problems? OAN falls into this, right? What's like the right end? So, to be fair about what the book is about, right? The book is really about like the corporate, like legacy media and those specific incidents that happened. Um, so it's not like a real, real criticism of the book. It's more just sort of like what, do we do about the center to the right end of this? Yeah. And and to be honest, I think that's why, you know, voices like yours and Sagers and, and Crystals, you know, have such a real, real value because there is something corporate about Fox. And and it's, you know, there there's a reason that Fox News is is, you know, or there's something that's notable about the fact that I could go and be in the the Fox News headquarters where many of their talent lives and and works, which is in New York. And it's across the street from MSNBC. I mean, it literally is across the street. It's walking distance. And it's walking distance from the New York Times and from the CBS and ABC. They are, you know, and sure, they've got people all over also. and, And, but they are very much a corporate structure that's part of a larger conglomerate that's got lots of corporate interests. And lots of, you know, when when the November 2020 comes around, as we see with text messages, there's lots of conversations about the financials and the bottom line. There, it, The incentive structure of Fox News is different than that of independent media also, even though they're trying to hit a different audience and they are hitting a different audience, they are, are saddled with some of the same problems that that plague the the corporate media that entities that we've talked about most of this time like the CNNs and the New York Times is of the world. And so I would say that from a Fox perspective, I would give them the same, you know, kind of uh diagnosis that I would with others, which is that you need more people that represent a larger swath of the country, you need people that um live outside of these beltways. It's not just ideological diversity, but geographic diversity and cultural diversity and people that don't want to become stars and and want to just do the hard work of journalism or or of connecting with people or just talking to people or just being annoying to people in power that's not something that you necessarily associate with Fox News in its current state i'd say maybe tucker excluded so i i i would say that there there's the so Fox is very successful. The business is strong, but from a from a cultural cachet perspective, there's a reason that there are lots of upstarts that I think are appealing to people that are maybe not necessarily hardcore political, but are culturally against the consensus opinion that's out there in the world um, on Twitter and elsewhere, and 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 they are not meeting that need, and that's why there are other people out there that are serving that, which is which is great. This is a little bit of a TBT in our last five minutes or so, but did you have any, we got this as an audience, as an audience question. I think this would be good to pose to you. Do you have any thoughts on the Stephen Crowder um, Daily Wire debacle? Um, not like the specifics of it, more just the idea of like, you know, there's this big brand who wants to be completely unfettered. The Daily Wire is also a big brand. They want to also have limits because they have advertisers and they have money on tech platforms. Do you have like a structural takeaway from that incident? Well, that, this I, is just going to keep on. I, I think, frankly, this is just going to, yeah. if we were saying earlier, like the, the debate is like, how do you as an independent brand, like attach yourself to a record label? That's the definition right. of a, this was a definition of a bad record label breakup. <laughs> exactly. Or yeah, a deal that look at the, the daily wire is, I, I think as we've seen is much more structured, like the, the older corporate media structures, like the, the New York times and the CNNs of the world, than a, a new media upstart might be. Um, they were at least from what we we know of the initial offer, were more interested in making a deal to be have Steven Crowder become part of the Daily Wire, not a partnership, not a content sharing thing. No, it was like we're building this business. It's good for our business to have you inside of, you know, as part of our whole. That's good for you. It's good for us. Um, Steven Crowder, obviously, you know, I think m- maybe he would have done that for the right amount of money, but 
I think, you know, in, from his perspective, he's more of an independent creator and he's looking for more of an independent thing. And and I guess he's now settled on Rumble, I believe is the latest that I've, I've heard. And maybe that makes the most sense for him. So I, I think it actually, you know, it, as, as much of there might have been alignment um, politically and culturally uh, with the points of view of a Crowder and a Daily Wire, from a business perspective, it wasn't, as you mentioned, it wasn't a good fit. And I think that that's interesting also, because I think we're seeing the numbers that we see there show that these are two entities that are operating outside of the the normal system, but there's a lot of money there and there's a lot of power there now. And so we're going to get this. We're going to get kind of things shake out where not everything is going to be a perfect fit because people are doing things in, in different ways. So for the last question, because I actually read the book, this is something I was super curious about. You're, you're, you're in Dallas, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm in, I'm in Austin. So we're both subject oh, nice. to this phenomenon. Um, you're writing about how it's a problem that media is so concentrated in DC and New York. A, a broad story that we tell on the realignment though, is that we have this like urban rural divide in this country. Right. So like my kind of reaction to your point about how like maybe if Orlando was like the center of a media, it'd be kind of different. My take is just kind of like, anytime you take any city, um, anytime you place, um, any institution in a city and not like a rural region, which you need to do for a media company on a couple of different levels, you're just going to like replicate that dynamic. Um, you're going to, it's going to be probably just as like out of touch, quote unquote, with let's say like heartland politics. Um, so I'm just curious, like what's your response? This isn't even a, I'm just like, what's your like, like what it, if CNN moved to Dallas, I still think the underlying like bias and like urban like dynamics you're describing would still probably replicate themselves. I'm curious like what you think about that. I think it wouldn't be a hundred percent fixed, but I think it'd be better. Um, look, I think Dallas, I, I love Dallas. I, I'm a big Dallas fan now. I'm, I'm adopted Texan. I've been here about nine years. It's about a 50, 50 city. Um, you know, the, the great thing about Dallas is that you could drive 20 minutes in one direction and be in the country, you know, be in like literal rural and I could drive 20 minutes and be in a city, you know, I'm also kind of in a suburb. And so you get, you get a nice mix there. I think the key though, is if, if they were to move more of a, of a headquarters to a place like Dallas is not then flying in all the people that wanted to, you know, that they were originally going to be in New York or DC and now having them in Dallas. No, the key is about finding the people that are outside of that, not politically, but culturally different, you know, people that have messy points of views. I think that's what's most missing in the in the corporate press is not necessarily that all of a sudden now you're going to have like people that are a bunch of Republicans that are going to be running CNN, but that people that are not easily put into a box are now going to be populating that newsroom. I think that, you know, I see that much more so in Dallas. I see there's much more, frankly, um, friendships and, and, you know, conversations and and ideas between people that have strong disagreements on certain areas happens a lot more easily, I think, here and other parts of the country. Um, it's not so. It's not perfect. The last thing I would just say is that I do think that one of the positives of COVID is that we've seen that work from home is very possible, especially in the media world. Get people in the places that they live. Find people in these rural areas, in the heartland, in places that are not in cities, and keep them there. You know, let them do their job there. Um, I think that that would be a huge benefit. Also, it's not you can you can have a hub in certain places, but you don't need to get everyone to one centralized location anymore. Very well stated, especially on the uh, my career level. That's a notice to everyone listening. Wet Marshall continue to live, to live in Texas and not have to move back to the Estella corridor, please. Uh, <laughs> this has been really great, Steve. Could you, I mean, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the book behind you, but can you shout out the book for those who are listening yeah. to the audio version? Absolutely. Yeah. Readuncovered.com. You can find the book uncovered um, wherever you get your books, Amazon, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you know, I've got an email address at the end of the book. Um, let me know what you think. Awesome. Thanks for joining me on The Realignment. Thank you.